each year at this speed. We also need to pursue the recovery of economies. There is a need for transformation into a decarbonized society rather than depending on the emission reduction by unfavorable events. On October 26, Japan's Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga declared to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. In Europe, some countries are already moving toward net zero. China and South Korea have also declared to achieve it by 2060 and 2050, respectively. There are clear signals from the government. The question now is how to realize this. Achieving net zero in Asia is especially important because half of global greenhouse gas emissions come from Asia. Today, we have four speakers. Dr. Kendaro Tamura from Japan, Dr. Jiang Keijun from China, Professor Navro Dubash from India, and Professor Rizal Dibois from Indonesia. First, they were delivering their 15 minutes presentations, after which we'll be moving on to the discussion. So during the presentation, we'll ring a bell for our timekeeping. One bell indicates that you have three minutes left, and two bells indicate that your time is up. Please uh, uh, keep the 15-time presentation. Now, uh, let me introduce our first presentator, pres presentator, Dr. Tamura. He's a program director and principal researcher of climate and energy area in IGES. He has centered his research on international cooperation on climate change, in particular the development and design of the international climate regime, political economy, and comparative studies of domestic climate and energy policy-making processes in major economies. His presentation is entitled Transforming Asia, Challenges and opportunities for green recovery toward net zero emissions. So, Dr. Tamura, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kainuma. Uh, good morning. Uh, to, good, not good morning. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Kentaro Tamura. I'm uh, going to present uh, transforming Asia toward net zero emission. Okay, so, okay, yep, I think. Yeah, okay, um, as a background uh, to my presentation, after the publication of the IPCC special report, on 1.5 degree uh, serious degree uh, global warming, there is a growing momentum for committing to net zero emission goal. And we are also facing COVID-19 crisis and many public figure pointed out uh, the COVID-19 recovery package can be designed to catalyze transformative changes. So against this background, we are now preparing a report named named uh, Transforming Asia to Net Zero Emissions. And today I'd like to present some of the uh, findings. The objective of this uh, report, uh, the exam first to examine the current status of climate and energy policy in Asia in terms of their cons consistency with long-term uh, temperature goal of Paris Agreement. The second, to examine how Asian countries' COVID-19 recovery package can be designed to promote long-lasting uh, transformative investment in decarbonizing inf infrastructure, inf inf infrastructure. And thirdly, to present possible Asian regional strategy to facilitate the pursuit of uh, net zero emission in consideration of further developmental needs, geopolitics, and societal changes. So my presentation will start with uh, current status of GHG emission, economy, and the future emission pathway, 
And I would provide a review of climate and development policy in Asian countries. Then I will examine COVID-19 recovery package and energy investment, in this, uh, investment, which are necessary for the net zero emission. Then I will discuss regional strategy for net zero emission. Then my presentation will conclude with some uh, takeaway, a take home uh, message. Okay, first. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, this slide shows the current status of GHG emission and economy of selected energy and countries. Regarding uh, left figure, a vertical axis uh, is GHG emission from land use, and horizontal axis is CO2 emission from fuel combustion. So all Asian countries' energy transition is key. Uh, but uh, for most of them, uh, land use sector is also, uh, uh, land use emit, uh, sector is emitting sources. So expansion of carbon sink through sustainable land use uh, transfer, uh, transition is also important for them, in, in particular for uh, Indonesia. The right figure is environmental Kuznet curve for Asian countries with GHG per capita at horizontal axis. Yeah, axis. And uh, uh, CO2 emission per capita on the uh, uh, vertical uh, axis. As you can see that uh, uh, decoupling of GHG growth and CO2 emission for them will be required uh, areas, uh, areas in Singapore and uh, Brunei by leap flocking. So they're pretty much uh, challenging for most of the Asian countries. Next, this figure showed uh, some changes in energy intensity from 1990 to 20, uh, uh, 2016 at the horizontal uh, axis, and it changes uh, in, in uh, emission intensity at the same time period for vertical uh, axes. As you can see, there is a significant improvement uh, in energy intensity here and also some for uh, rich country like uh, Singapore, uh, Brunei, the significant improvement in the decarbonization of energy uh, system. But to achieve net zero, uh, further energy intensity improvement and the decarbonization of energy system are required to achieve this point. And these figures uh, show a 1.5 degree goal compatible emission pathway for China, India, and ASEAN country. And this blue shadow uh, represents a range of modeling results of five integrated assessment models. Asian countries are expected to achieve net zero uh, in the latter half of this century if the world attained the 1.5 degree goal. And CO2 emission uh, need to be uh, achieved net zero in around 2055 for China, India, and ASEAN countries. Yeah. So we have only around 35 years. So this 35 year time horizon for CO2 net zero emission pose huge challenges for countries with various developmental issues. They have to pursue their mission while addressing various uh, developmental issues simultaneously. So this leads to the importance of linking climate mitigation policy with developmental objectives. Then 
we are conduct, now conducting a review of uh, policy, uh, which including long-term uh, strategy, NDC and developmental policy, and also COVID-19 recovery package in Asian countries. Uh, this review is still ongoing, but the preliminary results show uh, there uh, show uh, there tend to be the policy gap in a sense that short and medium term action are not informed by uh, long term uh, vision. And also there is a not yet net zero strategy in, in this region, which integrate climate and developmental policies. Okay. So next, um, yes. Uh, this, sorry, it takes, sorry, no study. okay. Uh, this uh, slide show, okay, I think, yeah, it's okay now. Yeah, this uh, slide shows some uh, energy rate recovery package in the Asian countries, practically China, India, ASEAN, and also the, the volume of energy related investment uh, towards net zero emissions. So it's difficult to see, but this 20, uh, this uh, left column, uh, this is the volume of the uh, COVID-19 recovery package, uh, which include only a public money. And this column uh, showed uh, the, the volume of energy related investment in 2015, which includes both private and public money. And project uh, crumbs uh, after 2020 uh, represent projection uh, of the energy related investment, which are required to achieve net zero. Uh, you can see the volume of this uh, COVID-19 recovery package a little bit uh, small compared with the, the necessary volume. S therefore, the recovery package need to be, need to privatize, uh, prioritize the sort of investment that can deliver immediate job and revenue, and also need to be uh, designed to mobilize private capital for long-term productive asset. Then that means uh, we think that we need some kind of regional collaboration for Asia to, to uh, achieve the net zero emission. But uh, the changing dynamics of geopolitics in the region have a huge implication, could be have implication for uh, Asia's uh, effort towards net zero emission. So we examined uh, two implications. Uh, first one is uh, co uh, competing inf infra infra infrastructure development initiatives. And you know that China uh, launched Belt and Road Initiative in 2014, and the US and Japan, uh, they also launched a kind of counter initiatives like free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and more recently Blue Dot Network as kind of uh, uh, infrastructure development initiatives. So they are, you know, uh, uh, called themselves uh, the green and clean, but uh, currently they are not, both initiatives are not uh, 1.5 degree compatible. So we have to see what implication for the future of this competitive uh, competition between uh, infra, infra development initiatives. So we examine two, three scenarios. First one is grid, uh, grid lock competition scenario. This one is, is the, continue to the continuation of the current uh, uh, situation. The second scenario is the coordination for net zero which might be possible under the leadership of uh, incoming president, hopefully uh, coming president uh, Biden. And the other scenario is uh, competition for net zero. 
even though the coordination failed, they are still possible to, you know, uh, competition for net zero can take place, uh, given the fact that the US and China uh, both are going to, uh, you know, uh, have a net zero uh, declaration. So, yeah, this is a kind of implication of this competition. And the other implication of the changing supply chain, uh, the, you know, uh, tension, uh, economic tension between US and China, and also recently the COVID-19 uh, pandemic crisis uh, pose a uh, very you know, Im uh, impact on the global uh, change, uh, supply chain, and, you know, uh, destructive in, 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 in a dis destructive way. So now there is a growing uh, interest for decoupling and reshoring and relocating manufacture uh, supply chain. So which uh, re could lead to the increase in the industrial production across Asian countries, and which means a growing importance for strengthening uh, local production capacity in terms of improvement of energy efficiency as well as decarbonization of energy system. So we conclude that uh, while geopolitics matters, still international and regional initiative become more important for net zero initiative in the Asian region. Then we exam or identify a few uh, areas for uh, regional collaboration or regional strategy for net zero emissions, um, which includes the both energy system and also land system. For land, uh, energy system, again, uh, uh, there are some collab 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 the area uh, includes both demand side and supply side. Uh, for supply side, may, which includes uh, the energy interconnection like AGM power grid, and also of, uh, this, this decentralized uh, renewable energy system, which come across both uh, demand side, supply side. And also negative emission initiative could uh, include both uh, energy system supply side and our land system. And also this agriculture and forestry transformation uh, are key area for regional collaboration to achieve net zero in Asia. Yeah, this is my last slide. Uh, as a take home, uh, take home message. So it is critically important to transform uh, COVID-19 recovery package into green ones, uh, thereby catalyzing public capital and, uh, sorry, catalyzing, sorry, uh, private capital and accelerating energy investment towards net zero emission. And also, while uh, changing dynamics of geopolitics matters, there remains the importance of seeking regional collaboration and strategy for net zero emission in various areas. And also societal changes caused by COVID-19 pandemic, as well as possible future changes in society and technical changes will form a ground to achieve net zero in Asia. So climate, policy and uh, regional strategy should take into this underlying element with a view to simultaneously meeting various developmental goals uh, and challenges. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tamura. And next, I invite Dr. Jiang Kejun. He's a senior researcher, Energy Research Institute, China. His research focus on energy, climate change, mitigation, and air pollution prevention policy assessment. And he has served as lead author on several IPCC reports. His presentation title is Going to the 1.5 degree warming target together. Dr. Jiang Kejun, the floor is yours. Uh, okay. Um... Let me share my screen. Um, which one? Uh, can you see that? It's my screen. Uh, 
Kein, kein Start? Okay, so I need to get. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Kain Masan. So, so good to see you, many so old friends. Um, my title is uh, uh, Let's uh, Think About China's uh, Future, but it uh, uh, seems now to getting 1.5 degree warming is getting to be a good idea, and maybe it's feasible by today. So, what I want to talk. Uh, sorry. This is uh, 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 the slide, actually we use the IPCC 1.5 degree warming re special report. So we do want to hope to hold down this line together uh, as a global, that means by 2050 and 2060, the global CO2 emission uh, will go to uh, net zero. So this is the way we want to go ahead together. And uh, some good news is, uh, Some good news. I don't know what happened. Yeah, uh, EU, Canada, China, Japan, Korea, South Africa, and uh, maybe US will will come uh, very soon uh, for the pro, uh, uh, how to say the target for carbon neutral at 2050. Uh, in China, is before 2060. So this is a line we are we are going ahead with that one, uh, and. Uh, I don't know what happened. So, uh, and uh, uh, that means uh, we're already in the halfway to do the 1.5 degree uh, target because uh, by now we nearly have 65% of you in the one in the world is committing to be a, a carbon neutral by 2050 or before 2060. So this is good news for us and. Uh, this will change many things. For example, technology leading countries are targeting on the carbon neutral. That means in the coming future, all the new technology uh, for energy and uh, how to say, and also for uh, manufacture are going to zero emission uh, technologies. And also many companies are setting up their target for the low carbon neutral. Uh, this is also very good news because anyway, we are relying on the manufacturers. And uh, if we do like this way, maybe all the countries can go to a carbon neutral together. Uh, this is a very beautiful picture we are doing like this way. And uh, this is a scenario for China actually I presented many times, even in the last year, or the year before last year, the ISAP uh, meeting. China is uh, trying to do some good job for this one. We want to commit for the middle century strategy for 2050. This is for two degree, this is one for the 1.5 degree. So uh, of course now, even though we propose this for some years, but the good news is our president announced China will do uh, carbon neutral before 2060. Uh, so we still hold down by 2050, China could be a carbon neutral. This will be in line with the 1.5 degree uh, warming target in the world. And uh, this is a study we did also present many times uh, for, uh, how to say, for, uh, from our model. We work together with uh, AIM uh, modeling team and IGS colleagues. Uh, so basically the Chinese energy transition, if we look at this one, this uh, primary energy demand is not a big difference with uh, uh, the two degree energy transition is quite similar. Only difference is uh, uh, we are doing more biomass power generation with, with CCS. That means the BECS uh, system to make sure the energy system could be a carbon neutral by 2050. This is a figure for the power generation. Uh, the biomass uh, power generation with the CCS could make sure the CO2 emission from in power sector by 2050 could be negative. In this way, we encourage all the uh, how to say all the sectors to use electricity. So this uh, uh, means we can go to negative emission electricity, then increase the share of electricity use in all the underuse sectors. Could be very important strategy in China for that. And also in the meantime, we also did a study for uh, air quality, uh, whether we can set up the target of 2050 to reach the 
WHO standard. This is a WHO standard. This is a Chinese uh, national standard. So we want to set up a national standard uh, to be reached uh, before 2030, and the, the WHO standard could be reached before 2050. But actually, because now the China's CO2 emission in many regions is very high, if we want to really go to this one, in our study is quite match with the uh, 1.5 degree energy transition uh, scenarios. And um, so if we want to really go to this one, that means uh, emission from energy activity will be nearly zero. Uh, emission for air pollutants, PM2.5, NOx, SOx, and uh, also VOC should be nearly zero. That means that there will be a transition demand on energy part from the real point of air quality improvement. And uh, of course, we also work very hard for the SDGs because in the uh, 17 SDGs, five to seven of that are very closely linked with uh, the uh, CO2 emission reduction and also energy transition in China. So we are working hardly on this one and uh, try to make sure China can reach all the 17 SDGs before 2030. And uh, now that we certainly found that uh, maybe the carbon neutral is no more an issue of mitigation. It's an issue of economy changing or economic transition. So basically, this can have for overall impact on economic development because all the economy should go to the carbon neutral based economy. And any supply, of course, will be have a very strong transition. And also, very big issue is the transition in end use sectors. And the new manufacturer process in some sectors is very important. For example, some industry sectors, which is very difficult to be uh, mitigated uh, for CO2 emission. And also, mitigation of greenhouse gases may increase GDP in China. We also published a paper about this one. And uh, just like what uh, the EU's report mentioned about, if they want to do the carbon neutral uh, by 2050, uh, actually the GDP in EU is increased more than 2%. We are the similar uh, data for China. That means that CO2 emission to be carbon neutral by 20, before 2060 also can increase China's uh, GDP. And also China's overseas investment are increased rapidly, we might want to make sure that China's overseas investment also match with the carbon neutral target in other countries. Um, and another funding from the modeling is uh, we certainly have very big transition for the uh, some uh, industry sectors, like still more making ammonia, uh, benzene, acetylene, methanol, clinker, and also heavy duty transport airplane. Uh, they need to be carbon neutral by 2050. And uh, then they have to totally change their process. For example, from uh, all your natural gas coal-based uh, to be hydrogen-based uh, process. And we do need the new technology to be uh, developed and uh, implemented uh, by 2050. And this is our scenario to think about with future, future the hydrogen demand in the methanol, acetylene, ammonia, steel making airplane, locomotive, ship, heavy duty truck. Uh, this means uh, in China, we can have more than uh, 50 million ton of hydrogen demand by 2050 in order to support the carbon neutral uh, scenario in these sectors. And uh, also very important thing, what happened in China is, uh, it's quite interesting. Today's uh, China's economy money in the cost uh, area. Uh, near the sea and the uh, ocean. So this is a very rich uh, part of China. But in the coming future, uh, when we do the carbon neutral economy, maybe the economy zone shift to the area which have a very cheap uh, solar uh, power. Uh, because once we have very cheap solar power, then we can have hydrogen, then we can have a uh, chemical industry uh, and also steel making to be carbon neutral. So maybe in the future, the China's economic zone shift to this area, to this area, and also to this area. Of course, here also very important one. Now we are calculate, calculating how much transport cost from here to the, the, the area, which is a demand center. So this picture gave us uh, some new ideas to think about the future economic transition. Uh, 
maybe more crucial for China's carbon neutral before 2060. And, um, but China is anyway doing a very good job right now. I'm a little, little happy with that. This is a figure uh, in the solar PV capacity uh, in 20, uh, this is 2012, this is 2013. You can see from 2012 to 2013, China almost doubled. So we start to actually start to uh, fly uh, in 2013 for China's uh, solar PV. This figure tell you what happened in 2019. So China is here and uh, we are much more above other countries. Uh, United States is second, but uh, it's uh, here. And so something like uh, less than half of China's uh, installed capacity. And also some good news is uh, China plan to do next five years. Every year uh, will increase nearly 70 gigawatt. Uh, this is uh, 2019, we do 30 gigawatt. So from 2021, we'll go to 70 gigawatt per year. And also another 40 gigawatt of wind. That means solar PV plus wind uh, every year in China will go to more than 100 gigawatt based on the planning. Uh, so they are on the right way. So based on our scenario for 1.5 degree, our demanding is every year something like 1. Uh, 130 uh, gigawatt uh, for solar and wind and hydro together another uh, 12 gigawatt of nuclear. So to make sure 1.5 degrees you know, happen. And uh, technology moving also very fast. This is electric bus. Every charging, they can run more than 800 kilometers. And uh, we also have for the overseas investment, now the China's increased very fast. This is uh, the peaking in 2016 due to the regulation change that decreased. But in the coming future, we make forecast China's overseas investment will be very big. Uh, but we make sure all the investment to be carbon neutral uh, in the coming years. So this is the idea we are talking about. And uh, finally, this is a study from our model that's increased the GDP for the 1.5 degree scenario and the 2 degree, or the, we already published the paper. Okay, I will finish here. And uh, um, this is a conclusion, so no carbon investment, maybe this is our carbon investment, uh, but they need money for success and be success. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jan Kejum. So the uh, next speaker is Professor Dubash from Center for Policy Research, India. He has been actively engaged in global and national debates on climate change, air quality, energy, and water for over 25 years. He is coordinating lead author for the IPCC and serves on the UNEP GAP Report Steering Committee. He will be presenting on India's emissions and energy future. Professor Dubash, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, colleagues from IGES, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, talk. I'm just sharing my screen. Please do let me know when you can see it. I thank you very much again. I'm uh, uh, privileged to be part of this panel with uh, August colleagues like uh, Jean Kajun and others. Um, uh, I uh, look very forward very much to the conversation that follows. Uh, what I'd like to do in the time that I have uh, is discuss a little bit about India's emissions and energy future in the context of the conversation that has been set up for us very nicely by Tamura, uh, Tamura san. Um, so I want to do three things uh, in the 15 minutes that I have. The first is I want to look at the challenges of projecting energy and emission futures and its implications for net zero. Now I'm starting with this because I think that we often start with an assumption that we know how to get to a net zero trajectory and I want to sort of look at that a little bit more carefully. Uh, the second is I reflect on the green recovery, self-reliance package that India put together. Uh, and then third, I, I, I reflect on the proposals that uh, our IHS colleagues have put before us for uh, some input. So to begin with, uh, what are India's challenges when we look at a net, zero, uh, a net zero future? Now, if you look at the top right diagram, essentially what we see is that India is starting from a much, much lower base of national income 
than most of our comparative countries, whether it's China, Brazil, Russia, or, or the US. Uh, and this diagram basically shows the percentile of country distribution at the bottom versus the percentile of global income distribution at the top. And so you can see that 80, some 85% uh, percent or so of Indians are actually below the 50th uh, percentile in terms of global uh, distribution. Right, so so the basically the bottom line is there are still a lot of poor Indians, uh, and the uh, development needs remain at the top of the agenda. Uh, also, because we're going through a demographic transition, some 10 million new jobs are needed per year uh, is what the estimates suggest. So it's a lot of job creation and development needs. Uh, if you look at the bottom left, this is a, a diagram similar to to those that Tamarasan has shown. Uh, which basically shows these kind of trails from 1961 to 2017. This is a log-log scale of GDP per capita versus energy use per capita. And you basically see that India has been slower to develop, which we all know as uh, compared to many other uh, countries. And as, as a result, both our GDP and our energy use per capita are quite, uh, uh, are quite low. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, the assumption in India is that our energy use per capita would have to grow quite a bit more uh, uh, in order to meet our development needs. Now, whether that can happen in a low carbon way, of course, is the next question. But energy, it is very hard to imagine that India can develop further without much greater energy use uh, per capita. So how much more energy, how much more carbon? This is the tricky question that I want to get to. Uh, so this next slide shows a series of national and global models for India's energy uh, uh, consumption in 2050. And what you will see, it's, it's quite startling. The range is, is, is enormous. So each of these clusters of dots represents one study. Uh, but you can see that the range is, is enormous, both for the assumed 2050 GDP as well as the assumed 2050 final energy consumption. So everywhere from on the order of uh, uh, 20 exajoules up to 100 or even 120 exajoules. That's a huge range. So for an Indian policymaker to try and understand how much energy India needs is extremely challenging. And the reason for this, uh, of course, this is true in every country, but I think it is more true in countries that are lower down the development curve because we are making big, big transformations in areas like our pattern of industrialization. We're making big changes in our patterns of urbanization. And so there are, the, there are more degrees of freedom for where we might go. If you compare this to an industrialized country, which has already built its infrastructure, or even to China, where infrastructure is far further advanced, there isn't that much that can change over a 20 year period. In India, the projection is an awful lot can change over a 20 year period. And so the pattern of urbanization, the pattern of industrialization will strongly shape uh, um, our, our future. And because we, and so when we do energy models, we tend to discuss the energy parameters, but actually the underlying economic parameters and the underlying assumptions about what sort of industry and urbanization we will follow are almost more important. I just want to punctuate that with one more graph. So this basically looks at industrial final energy consumption in 2050. And India is down here. This is, the, this is the point that India is now in 2018 uh, at the bottom left here. This is industrial final energy consumption versus GDP per capita. And all the dots, the colored dots are again model representations and the dotted lines and their intersection represent comparative countries. So for example, China is up here and South Korea is, is near the top of the corner of the, of the graph. Now, what trajectory will India follow? As this graph suggests, it is, the, each of the models has a different idea about what trajectory India will follow and how fast it will move by 2050. So this, this India Markal study in green here suggests that India is going to move very far, very fast and in the direction of Korea. Uh, this brown dot here suggests that India is going to move in the direction of China in terms of uh, the, the ratio of industrial energy, uh, F, uh, final energy consumption to GDP per capita. So my point is, there are a lot of uncertainties here, which is what makes understanding the implications of a net zero target extremely challenging analytically. 
So what is the best we can say about India's future? Uh, in order to try and address some of these complexities, some colleagues and I put together a uh, 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 modeling, uh, basically an interpretive study of the various models. Again, all of these dots represent different scenarios and models on this graph. This is now annual 2030 CO2 emissions on the y-axis over average annual GDP growth rate because the growth rate matters a lot. And you see that the studies assume anything from a 6.5% growth rate to an 8% uh, growth rate. Uh, uh, at the origin here is uh, a 2 gigaton CO2 um, uh, uh, number, which is basically India's emissions in 2015, right? So for 2030, these red lines are our NDC target, which was 33 to 35% below uh, 2005 levels. And what you see is that there's a cluster of studies that, over, that, that suggest we will go above the NDC line, but these are older studies with older policy assumptions. All the newer policy assumptions cluster around the NDC line. So all these modeling studies suggest that we are likely to hit our NDC target, but that India's emissions are definitely going to grow by 2030, but by no means at the pace that China's grew, say from 2000 to 2015. So India's emissions are going to grow, but they're not going to grow at an extremely rapid rate. And, uh, 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 and a, a new generation of modeling studies is underway to look at when net zero might actually be, be, uh, be uh, achieved. But notably, we see a lot of difference between Indian studies and global studies on all of these. I don't have time to get into that, but, but you will see that in the modeling uh, results. So what does all this mean for net zero targets? So the first point is that in rapidly changing economies, the predictability of energy and emissions future is extremely uh, difficult to achieve, right? It is very hard to know what is going to happen given the structural changes and when you're starting from a low base of, of development. The question is, will setting a net zero, so in that context, setting a net zero target and understanding the implications of it for development are quite hard. The question is, will it help us move to a low carbon future more rapidly if we set a net zero target? And, and perhaps it will have some, uh, some benefits. We will understand, for example, certain choices that may or may not uh, uh, that we should not take if we want to end up at net zero. But I continue to feel that future net zero targets, say India sets something similar to China 2060 target or maybe a little bit beyond, projecting back or, or backcasting to what that means today is an extremely difficult analytical task. And it's not a task that actually will command political attention. What will command political attention? long-term, uh, rather than long-term goals, it is short-term goals. So Kishun mentioned air pollution. That is a big driver in India. So if we push very hard for air pollution, it is likely to be a more significant driver of change than a net zero uh, target. And so I suggest that focusing on development co-benefits is more likely to drive the shifts that we need in energy policy and long-term strategy, things like air pollution, congestion in cities, uh, and energy security. Uh, this is not to say that we don't look at a net zero target, but to be realistic about it, more specificity on these other things is likely in a democracy like India's uh, to win more political support. Um, and the opportunity that we see before us, and we have to frame it as an opportunity, is to avoid lock-in to high carbon pathways today, right? So the choice of industrialization, urbanization, and even behavioral choices. We've seen a lot more work from home, for example, in this COVID period. Those are all significant shifts that one can try and uh, 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 build on to make sure we avoid a high carbon future pathway. So let me turn now to India's COVID recovery package and, and to look at how much it has actually contributed to this sort of uh, mindset and thinking. So our total uh, package was on the order of 10% of GDP but that uh, is probably independent analysis say that's really an overestimation. It's closer to 2% of GDP if you exclude central bank, uh, so non-fiscal actions, as well as various existing measures that were already on the book. If you look at what is truly new and truly fiscal and, and, and policy, it is closer to 2% of GDP. Um, what are the big ticket items that we see uh, uh, in terms of expenditures? 
So one is uh, this expenditure, the gray shade here of free LPG cylinders for poor households uh, and stocking up the strategic oil reserve. So the LPG cylinders is actually um, potentially uh, carbon positive because it's displacing biomass. Uh, but of course it has huge local uh, benefits in terms of women's time and local air pollution exposure. The second, the second is a, a series of packages to augment uh, coal evacuation and coal transportation. So there's a big brown component uh, to this package. The third is a liquidity injection for electricity distribution companies. And this is purely to enable them to get out from one, what is under a big sort of debt uh, burden. And finally, a small amount of money for uh, plantations and forests. Now, there are also a series of other measures. I won't go through these in great detail because uh, 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 there's a long list, but uh, many of these other measures are hard to quantify because they don't have uh, financial, they're, they're policy measures without, without fiscal measures associated with them. I just want to highlight one, which is the continued must run status for renewable energy, as well as a series of other renewable energy promotion policies. So the government of India has both promoted renewable energy and promoted uh, coal. Uh, to my own mind, the economics suggests that renewable energy will have much more uptake than coal. I don't think the coal measures will have such a significant effect, but there's no doubt that there is, that they are included in the, in the package. So uh, this is now my, my second last slide, so I'll end shortly. Um, so what do we take away from the green recovery package? Uh, the size, as I've said, is modest if you look at it uh, in practice, and there is a lot of fiscal pressure uh, in India. There's an overwhelming protect focus on protection and protective measures. So a liquidity injection, particularly for medium and small uh, enterprises and for farmers, emergency food gains provision. This is just basic measures to prevent uh, households really sort of starving and, and, and facing deprivation. There's some support for renewable energy, but also support for coal. And there is very limited exploration of the kinds of long-term structural changes that we are all looking for. The kinds of things that the government could have done and hasn't explored fully yet, but hopefully will, is accelerated phase out of all coal-fired power plants, uh, using some of the uh, money that has gone into India's Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which is a massive anti-poverty measure, to try to bring that to bear on climate uh, resilience, uh, and also think about broader changes in our agricultural system, uh, because farmers, in a sense, are amenable to shifts uh, at, at this time, or more amenable than they normally are. Okay, just to wrap up, uh, a few reflections on the IGS proposals. Um, the first point is that, um, uh, you know, I recognize in the, in the, in the presentation by Timurasan, they said that integration of climate and development may not be sufficient. And that's true, but I do think it is necessary. And I think, as I said, in the short run, it may yield more policy change than abstract net zero targets. So I have a healthy skepticism of net zero targets. I, I hear my time is up. Let me just quickly finish these bullet points. Um, recovery packages should prioritize jobs and structural changes that create uh, uh, green jobs. As I said, I don't think that the coal uh, promotion is going to have much effect in India because of market forces. Uh, there's promote proposals for energy interconnection in Asia. But I think that that requires a very strong basis for political cooperation. Uh, I do think the areas for collaboration are air pollution and low carbon industrial processes, which Kejun also mentioned. Uh, we need to think about how to integrate renewable energy into a vision of 21st century urbanization. And I think in terms of global commitments, we need a slightly more elastic concept that does look at an ambition gap, but also looks at an implementation gap. It's very important what we do and not just what we say. So those are my thoughts. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Dubash. And uh, uh, last but not least, we have uh, Professor Rizal Dibor here with us. He's an executive director, Center for Climate risk and opportunity management in Southeast Asia and Pacific. Institute Pertania Bokor University, Indonesia. 
He has been working on issues related to greenhouse gas mitigation strategies and climate change adaptation since 1998. He is highly active in co conducting a number of studies related to policies supporting low carbon. So he presents on uh, transforming Asia challenges and opportunities, focusing on Asian countries, especially Indonesia. So uh, thank you, uh, Rizal Dibor. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Aino Ma Sensei. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, everybody. So now I would like also to uh, present a bit on the work that we are working um, related to the transforming Asia challenge and the opportunities for the green recovery toward net zero emission focusing in Indonesia, uh, but as uh, touch a bit on, on the Asian countries. As you might already know, the actually Asian countries account for about 3.5% of the global greenhouse gas emission. And we expect that for the case of India, it might also increasing to the future. So that also might also happen that actually the, the, the emission might increase to the future if there is no actually strong policy and structural change happening. But if you look at um, Asian countries, Indonesia is the largest contribution to total emission. And you can see from the uh, right hand figures that actually Indonesia is the highest in terms of the emission because of the size of the country, including also the population. But of course, uh, in terms of the source of the emission, actually, when you chain and uh, forestry uh, play an important role in terms of uh, their contribution to the total national emission, and followed by the energy sector. Uh, in the NDC of Indonesia, it is very clear that actually our uh, target in NDC is still far away uh, for meeting the 1.5 degree or, uh, or 2 degree uh, target especially for the energy sector. And you can see here, actually, this actually the, the current uh, NDC target, uh, which are the conditional, uh, uh, unconditional target. And then it is, uh, if we go, if we look at the, the path for the two degree target, or we call it deep decarbonization, the path for 1.5 degree target. So actually it is, it is still very far. And there is a stand, actually, there is no peak. We do not know yet because we haven't actually have a, a, a clear policy when actually our peak emission from energy sector will happen. But of course, um, from the discussion and also the possible uh, intervention on the policy related to the energy, it might happen that actually the peak of emission for the energy sector might happen in, 2000, in 2038. And then the, with, uh, with the reducing the, our reliance on the coal and then increasing the use of renewable sources of the energy so you might actually going down uh, into the uh, into the uh, Paris target, even though still not really able to achieve that. But of course, in the context of uh, agriculture and forest and land use, there is an opportunity actor we can also go down into a net sink. Uh, so I can talk about that a bit more in the in the later section. Um, so in the context of energy, so there are three scenarios uh, what we are we, uh, that we can do. Uh, even though none of this scenario is 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 uh, being discussed in, uh, in in depth, but of course uh, among the three, actually the second one actually now get an attention uh, because actually we might still uh, rely on, uh, to some extent on the coal, but we may offset uh, the the emission from these sources through introduction of technology, carbon capture storage, and also on the, on the biomass energy. So the. the so the first scenario is actually we're trying to employ all the potential of our renewable energy for meeting our uh, our uh, energy demand. Uh, but of course, there are some constraint and barrier uh, for for implementing the first uh, scenarios because most of the resources that we have located in, in, in eastern part of Indonesia might also require a high investment for transforming the energy into the Java uh, or Western power of Indonesia. So the, the investment for the lining system under, under the sea, it may, uh, it may, really, it may cost uh, Indonesia very high. Um, and the second, as I mentioned before, uh, renewable energy and carbon capture storage in this actually we, can, if we cannot really uh, follow the first scenario. So we still uh, rely on, uh, on, the, uh, on fossil fuel 
and how we can really reduce that uh, by uh, by applying the, the uh, carbon capture storage technology, including biomass. And the third scenario, uh, economic structural change scenario, is to consider the role of structural change in Indonesian economy, in which the implementation of more service-oriented economy, uh, but it seems to me that this kind of scenarios might not really um, uh, very feasible. Um, so, uh, so the scenario two has been get attention in the discussion in the economy. Um, but we, by looking at actually the role of forest and other land use, where actually uh, for a potential to become a net sink by 2050, so it may also offset some of the emission from the energy uh, to help the country to reach the Paris target. But if you look at the scenario of our value, so you can see here actually by 2050, we, are, we might reach already net sink. By 2040, actually net, uh, the net sink uh, already achieved. And there are some of the uh, uh, condition that might happen that we expect to happen in the future uh, to meet the, uh, to this condition. And there is a significant decrease in deforestation, especially there is no more unplanned deforestation or illegal deforestation and encroachment, things like that, because of the implementation of strong policy in enhancing the institutional capacity of management of forests and land in the forest area. And the second you all can see from the, the, from the right graph, so we can also turn back from the emission into a net, into a thing, especially in our forest, by, by enhancing um, the forest regeneration, so enrichment planting. So this is also one of the, uh, one of the big strategies that might can turn uh, the Indonesian uh, uh, range use change sector into a net thing. And of course, the important one, also the restoring of degraded land, uh, through the introduction also a political culture system, a mixed farming system which adapted the pitland ecosystem, uh, which also lead into the significant decrease in the pit fire. As everyone knows, active pit fire is also one of the big issues as the big source of emission in Indonesia. So the restoration of the degraded pitland with introduction of uh, in political culture system or agroforestry which act to adapt it into the pitland ecosystem. So it may also reduce the risk of the fire in the pit and also contribute to the economic and, and community livelihood. And the third, uh, of course, to meet that, actually boosting the reforestation through the social forestry, social forestry program, where the government also uh, have targeted to, to implement the social forestry program by about uh, 10, 12 million hectare, even though the implementation is still not, uh, still not really meet the target, but now it's only uh, risk about 3 million hectares that are still uh, uh, large of the area need to be uh, to be uh, uh, supportive for the for adopt, uh, for the social forestry, but now actually the social forestry also can support the food security and energy security program. What it means actually the activities or so community activity in the social forestry can also uh, include the uh, the agriculture community as a food, but in 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 the previous uh, uh, policy actually in the forest area. Uh, it is not allowed to, to have agricultural community, but in reality, there are many of the forest area in Indonesia is being occupied by the community for the for monoculture uh, agricultural system. But now, by providing a legal access for the community to manage the forest area, so it means that still allowed to manage the forest area for supporting the economy, but the farming activities should be uh, not monoculture system, but need to be changed into an uh, agroforestry system or mixed farming system. Uh, so it could also be uh, integrated with, with the, with the uh, livestock, including feed, and also for fishery, uh, agrofishery system, especially in, in, the, in, the, in the mangrove forest. And of course, uh, the, the important uh, policy also to boosting the productivity of agriculture crops it's actually one of the key strategy how it can really reduce the demand for land, especially for the estate plantation where actually the, uh, the uh, mass of the agriculture land now is being um, uh, occupied for the palm oil. Almost half of the of the estate plantation uh, actually uh, uh, covered by the palm oil, and and but now actually the government also uh, limited that the palm oil areas should not uh, more than 16.5 million hectare. But in the reality on the ground, based on the recent recent finding, it's already go up into 19 uh, 19 million hectare. Um, but of course, uh, the problem in this palm oil actually uh, half of the palm oil plantation actually is owned by smallholders, 
uh, well, actually the level of productivity are still very low. Um, uh, and some of the area also located in the in, in, in the in the in the forest area, and also in some of the area which is not only uh, uh, legal. So so government also uh, put uh, also a policy on that uh, how actually also to relieve some of the forest area to become uh, uh, private land uh, that actually owned by the community who already occupy this area. So by having this clean and clear status of the land. So the community can also get a right and access in the subsidy of the government, including facilitation, also uh, uh, seed support, uh, and also uh, help them to get also uh, subsidized uh, input uh, for, 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 for agriculture. So, so, so the combination of the three scenarios that I mentioned, of course, the three scenario in energy actually targeted to, uh, to, to the deep decarbonize, which means that actually they they can go down into 1.6 uh, ton CO2 per capita by 2050 through three scenarios, as I mentioned. But the, the second scenario, uh, so renewable and carbon capture storage is most likely scenario that might be followed. If we combine that with the Avalo, so we can see that in Indonesia by 2050, the emission per capita might reach 1.25 uh, uh, ton of CO2 per capita. Still, actually, we cannot reach the zero emission by that time. Uh, but of course, there are still possibility that we can also boost the, the scenarios. Probably, uh, I'm not quite sure because it's mentioned by Fred, the possibility of having an interconnected system for supplying the energy. And also, also thinking because Indonesia still rely much on the coal for producing the energy. So there's a possibility also the Australia who also going to employ a very big solar panel. So, so it might be also transfer of energy or selling electricity from Australia to Indonesia. It can, uh, so this might also another uh, interconnected system, of course, not among the ASEAN countries, but this is also one of the things that has been uh, mentioned and being discussed, even though this is not very uh, put into a, a, a intense discussion yet. So what are the challenges I have mentioned in a, a slightly bit before? Uh, uh, for the energy technical transformation, limited renewable deployment due to competition with low cost fossil fuel, and the distribution infrastructure uh, uh, limitations. So this is also one of the uh, big issues uh, because uh, the renewable energy is still not receive kind of subsidy. The subsidy uh, uh, for the fossil fuel uh, causing the uh, low uh, cost for the fossil fuel also reduce the, 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 the interest on that. Um, and then also uh, leaving the coal for a uh, source of our energy is also not interested uh, 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 interesting policy because it's uh, as uh, the most of the government are still a bit hesitant to leaving the strategic asset stranded. So this actually is one of the issues, and probably will be also nice to have a discussion that can experience for from China how they can also moving away from coal uh, in the short term by employing more uh, renewable energy. And uh, bioenergy production target is bio biofuel. Also, uh, this also one of the strategy to increase the share of renewable, especially from the biofuel and biomass energy. But it also increased the risk of deforestation uh, because there is also competition of land with food crops. But in terms of challenge the baseline, in, improvement of law, uh, uh, improvement of land and forest management might require also high investment and also change, uh, and also optimizing the use of product productive land, in particular in addressing the land tenure issues. There are so many land are actually uh, a conflict, uh, uh, especially uh, in in the forest area. So this also also sometimes uh, limit also the the, uh, the use of the unproductive land. So many of the land remain uh, abandoned and not utilized because of situation. And then uh, also reducing the agricultural worker due to the urbanization, uh, it may also uh, limit the possibility of boosting productivity. And they also might need to have in the future how actually the agriculture system need to be more more modernized using the machinery, agricultural machinery, because it's also uh, one of the uh, uh, challenge as well, and also incentive system for accelerating the development of timber plantation in the degraded land, and also conserving production forest and pit restoration. And, and and the opportunity, as I mentioned now, actually, one is ecological field cost transfer policy, where the government now to provide a, a, a new uh, policies. How actually the transfer of the fiscal is also considering uh, considering the ecological indicators. So it's mean the, uh, the government uh, who actually used the performance indicator in the development using the ecological indicators 
and then the achievement that uh, in in meeting this indicator ecological indicator will also be used as a basis for transfer the transferring the 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 the, uh, the, fund, uh, the uh, fund the fund fund for for the local government as well as the establishment of public service agency for environmental fund who act now as host to this agency stepping also the funding uh, from the international so the result based payment for example for rddd this also can be accessed uh, supporting the government uh, local government also others uh, private sector uh, to use the fund for for uh, in, for investing on on uh, low carbon uh, infrastructure uh, and the certification policy for the concession in which actually uh, all the concession who have a high conservation area in their concession need also to protect that otherwise they might need to pay a kind of penalty or a, a penalty so the cost of the, the the penalty may also be used again for uh, uh, for the conservation especially for the RSP members uh, as there is no waste actually for the concession company who, who have a, a area with high carbon stock including also the conservation value to use that then for 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 establishing the the plantation so it's also one of the uh, strategic uh, 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 issues that may also need to be considered how actually this remediation or penalty fund also be used uh, for uh, for for supporting the uh, uh, any stakeholders uh, and managed by the by the public service agency for in the environmental fund under the current policy, actually, the use of the fund it is up to the companies. So they can also uh, create a partnership with the seed parties, or they can do a conservation project together. But again, it's also not easy because if it is put under the public service agencies, uh, so the implementation of the activities can be also looking at the landscape base and integrated in integrated way. And the implementation of Morata policies, the government also do, not going to uh, issue any new permit for for area with, uh, covered by the primary forest including on the uh, on the pit plan as well as the carbon pricing policy still also, you know is under ways uh, the is going to be uh, effective in the in the in the in coming years uh, once when the this uh, regulation are signed by the president so actually we may also introduce kind of cap uh, or emission cap for any uh, for some of the industrial uh, or companies um, uh, uh, who actually emit a very high emission and of course, by using this, this uh, policy, we hope that actually the the adoption of low carbon technology might also be accelerated and also can uh, also uh, uh, support the, uh, the implementation of a conservation program uh, or a reforestation program. multi premier for the concession also address the issues about the uh, tenurial conflict. Uh, and here is mean actually the uh, uh, many of the concession company actually uh, or the uh, some of the uh, concession areas being occupied also by communities but the communities normally are pre in preference to continue their activities using the agriculture commodities while actually the company they cannot really implement uh, cr planted other crops uh, other than what has been uh, issued in their permit so by having by by multi permit actually the company can also implement many kind of uh, uh, business activities including eco eco ecosystem services how they can also can create a partnership with the community uh, surrounding on inside the concession as well. So, uh, so through this, actually, uh, hope we can also increase the the, the use of the um, unproductive land, especially the one in the conflict, uh, for for productive uh, activities. Um, um, and then social forest in agrarian has been mentioned before. So these actually are some of the opportunities how we can really make a transformation toward net zero emission, especially in our sector. So because of the time is not possible, and I also I think I, I would like to end my my session here, and are very welcome for further discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rizaudi. So uh, now we will dive into the discussion. So uh, we have received many comments from the audience, and thanks for your contributions. In the interest of time, we'll pick up just a few. And the first question is, uh, can net zero be achieved without carbon trading and or carbon capture and storage? So uh, I, I invite uh, Dr. Tamura to answer uh, this question. It's uh, this uh, carbon trading yeah. issue. Or maybe I'll touch upon the carbon capture and carbon storage. Yeah, okay, she, okay. She is. okay. 
Yes, I think CCS is a critical uh, technology mm. uh, to achieve uh, net zero. Mm. Uh, especially for um, developing countries. But in case of Japan, um, the critical challenge is a uh, storage site. Uh, there are a lot of, now currently, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, survey is going on to exam, to, you know, uh, kind of a, a reasonable uh, storage site uh, within Japan. But uh, so far, we, 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 you know, it's not so much volume can be stored uh, in the Japanese uh, territory. So uh, that's, a, I think, a huge uh, kind of a, a challenge for Japan. So what would I suggest is that, you know, so CCS is not kind of a silver bullet technology. So it can be only used for uh, those industry or sector which are really difficult to uh, mitigate the emission, such as uh, for the, uh, for the steel or cement. So, yeah, yeah, that's uh, my answer. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Rizaldi, do you, um, you mentioned about carbon pricing. So, uh, carbon pricing and uh, carbon trading could be a little bit different, but uh, can you uh, also explain or uh, answer this question? Uh, can net zero be achieved without carbon trading? Yeah, I clear that. Yes, thank you. So, I clear that in terms of carbon pricing, now government also think. The, uh, of the uh, international carbon trading is already happening, but as Indonesia also have uh, mm -hmm. their own target for meeting the uh, for the NDC target, it's the government trying to also to to I mean to uh, to to uh, to stop uh, 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 for for trading the carbon internationally, but instead actually the government are trying to create domestic carbon uh, carbon market carbon trading. So it means actually the, the, the credit is being created from the trading within the country and now going to pass to international. So these are the things that what uh, in, the, in the policies that we are, uh, we, are, we are doing. So of course, uh, through this policy, actually we pass the cost of emission, the cost of emitting to the, to the emitters. It's meant, all the, it's meant actually the government might create kind of cap for a certain uh, industrial activities or could we might also to, for the power sector um, that can put them to, I mean, to increase the share of the, the renewable sources, uh, uh, the emission from the lining system. Um, because um, for the company, for the industry company who actually still rely on the, on the lining system, right, they might also decentralize their, uh, their, their uh, 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 energy production system by, their own, by, the, by their own plan. So there are many uh, uh, possibilities uh, how actually this carbon pricing might trigger the change uh, in, 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 in the countries. Uh, but of course, uh, for, for, for the international trading, Indonesia is still uh, um, uh, trying to limit that, uh, to avoid the transfer of a credit to outside of the countries. Yeah, thank you very much. It's very interesting that you are working on within the uh, domestic, uh, domestic uh, reduction and uh, not uh, not so much or a little rely on the uh, carbon trading from the outside uh, outside your countries uh, so next question uh, this is to uh dr dubash and is there a concern in some country that net zero is an um, an unachievable uh, slogan rather than farm policy this is a question for the audience can you uh, um, Say something about this. This is uh, as to the to to you to you, uh, Dr. Dubash. Uh, thank you. Or, uh, it's yes. an achievable a slogan, or just for, could be the farm policy. Hmm. So, uh, so let me let me answer it this way. I think every one of us wants to see net zero. The question is, is the way to best way to achieve net zero by setting a net zero target or is the best way to achieve net zero in the immediate term to push as hard as we can on areas where we know there is a lot of political attention, like our urbanization policy, our industrialization policy, uh, trying to get low carbon industrial processes, trying to ramp up renewable energy. So my, my own sense is that even if India were to set a net zero target, 
we wouldn't have a clear sense of what it means for us in terms of our development trajectory. Uh, and when it comes to the bureaucrats and the decision makers in key sectors, as well as investors in key sectors like energy and so on, they are going to be driven more by things like India's renewable energy target, uh, by our efforts at building cities around public transport. These are the things that will drive decisions in the short run. So net zero may be useful as a background context, but the immediate question is how do we bring low carbon uh, conversations to development? How do we make development truly low carbon in a sector by sector way? And then we have to add up what that means in terms of our carbon target. But the immediate decisions are going to be driven by those factors. Uh, 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 and the net zero kind of language is more for the international community. In India, what will drive the discussion is how do we achieve development objectives in a low carbon way? Uh, so I hope that helps answer the, uh, uh, the, the audience member's yeah. question. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's very, very clear. And the third question is addressed to Dr. Jack Ejun. And the question is, is there any possibility of aviation and shipping uh, tra transitioning to net zero emissions? Uh, Yes, uh, we did a study for that because our scenario by 2050 is go to carbon neutral, including auto transport. So in our scenario uh, for the carbon neutral by 2050 for airplane, uh, is, uh, uh, with the airplane, uh, the seat, more than 50, uh, we are go to hydrogen based. Uh, it depends on the research and the development of a hydrogen airplane schedule. And uh, half of the big airplane will also use uh, biofuel, biojet fuel. And uh, for the smaller airplane with uh, the seat less than 50, we'll use a battery uh, driving uh, airplane. So this is uh, in our airplane scenario. And the ship is a similar story. Uh, with the ship um, uh, larger than uh, 5,010 and uh, tanker ships, they will use a uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell driving and uh, the other ships will use the battery based uh, shipping. So this is uh, in our scenario. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Airbus also announced that uh, by 2035, yes. they will introduce hydrogen uh, airplane. So uh, we could uh, uh, achieve the NFL, uh, in the uh, from the aviation and ship shipping sector. So uh, 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 from ISIS, uh, the uh, recent, re uh, not re uh, in near, very, very future, uh, we, uh, Tamara Sang and colleagues uh, published Net Zero uh, Report, Asia, Net Zero Asia Report. And uh, in this report, uh, uh, we are very uh, much concerned about the collaboration. So the, uh, I would also ask the, uh, the uh, speakers uh, about the uh, possibility of collaboration. What kind of collaboration is possible to achieve green recovery? We would appreciate it if you could introduce us, including the uh, regional strategy uh, that we already sent you the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint that introduce it, the collaboration. So uh, some of you uh, already uh, uh, introduced or explained and about the collaboration, but uh, could you finally the, uh, elaborate more about this uh, collaboration? Uh, first, uh, Jan Kejun, uh, can you? Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, we did think about this that kind of collaboration. And I think the collaboration is very crucial because Asia as a big family, we can work together for the carbon neutral. And uh, in my presentation, I mentioned about the, the mitigation of CO2 emission reductions, no more mitigation issues. It's a technology and economic development issues. So if we want to have a better uh, future economic development, we must work together. Uh, for example, Japan is very leading in many technologies, 
China is following up and also leading on many renewable energy technologies. And India also a big player in the new technology development. So I think uh, if we can work together and also uh, think about the uh, uh, emission from the forest from Indonesia, that means we have a lot of collaboration together to make a whole picture for the one perfect degree pathway for all Asian countries. Uh, we are neighbor and it's also a big family, <laughs> even in Kentaro sounds mentioned about the geopolitical, but I think collaboration on the climate change is a very good way to put them uh, us together uh, as a big family. I do want to see a future of a collaboration and uh, family member to work together, like uh, to have a very good future for all Asian countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhang. Okay, and uh, may I also uh, can I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Dubash on this issue, on the uh, future possibility of future collaboration in Asia. Dr. Dubash. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So I think that uh, uh, collaboration uh, is going to be essential given the scale of the challenges we face. But we have to be very careful about where we, uh, where we place our, our, our bets. Uh, I think Adrian was talking about how um, uh, I, I thought it was very interesting the amount of money that uh, Kajun was talking about China is likely to is envisioning in terms of in terms of overseas uh, investment and, and cooperation. And of course, it's very important that that that, that be directed in a, in a low carbon rather than a higher carbon uh, direction. On the technology front, I think the big area for collaboration is, in fact, uh, uh, low carbon industrial uh, technologies for, for, uh, for, for uh, uh, heavy industry in, in particular. That is an area that, that it, technological cooperation makes a great deal of sense. Another area I would suggest is urbanization and how does one integrate the renewable energy transition into patterns of urbanization and public transport and so on and so forth. So how do we build uh, 21st century uh, greener cities? And again, this is a very ripe area for India because we are lower down that urbanization process. We are only about 30% urbanized, expecting to go to about 50% urbanized over the next 20, uh, 20 or so years. So urbanization is another big area. And the third area I would flag is uh, air pollution. Uh, and this is a problem that, of course, China and India face in common. India has unfortunately become uh, has overtaken China in this area. This is the one area we didn't wish to overtake China, but it is the area we have overtaken China, unfortunately. Uh, and and I think that this is uh, it's probably true in other uh, Asian metropolis, metropolitan areas as well. So these are three big areas I can see for uh, as a focus for collaboration. On the electricity idea of sort of an Asian electricity grid, I'm a little bit more wary uh, simply because of energy security reasons. I think we have to have a very strong base of geopolitical uh, cooperation in Asia before countries are going to be able, willing to open up uh, uh, to electricity grids. And, I, and, and, and unfortunately, in our region, uh, tensions are higher than they have been in the recent past. Uh, and, and, and I think we should actively, it, it's a larger geopolitical question. I hope that those tensions are, are reduced shortly, but we need to uh, have that basis of uh, deeper trust uh, for, those, uh, for those grids to be uh, effective and functioning. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dubash. And uh, recently, uh how do you think uh, the collaboration uh, within ASEAN or uh, the within the Asian region? Uh, yeah, I see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, probably there are many points that has been mentioned by previous speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, capacity, uh, building exchange. But probably I just want to add one more because we also do not have the time. Uh, so as you know, actually, because there are also a trading of the agricultural commodities uh, across Asia countries, including also China with Indonesia, and China also one of the country who also receive our palm oil. So probably my uh, across the Asian countries might also need kind of, uh, the following kind of standard as well for the agricultural commodities. So it actually can also push, I mean, the change in the country uh, uh, into a sustainable uh, production system. But of course, there might also need to be created kind of incentives that might be also uh, set up within the region. Uh, how actually the acceleration or transformation of, of, uh, of, of agricultural practices uh, can happen uh, in, in the members. 
in the in the family uh, Asian countries. So I think that's the thing that I just would add, add a bit. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. And now I'll uh, move on to the closing remarks. Uh, we have discussed the topic, how can we meet the two goals of recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and combating uh, climate change? So lots of discussions have been done and we have raised many uh, issues. And there, as Rizaldi also pointed out, that uh, investment, uh, job creation, economy, uh, recovery and development economy, and uh, reduction in industry sector, hydrogen demand, solar uh, PV, a spread of solar PV or uh, the emission and absorption from the agriculture in agriculture and forest areas. They are the uh, important uh, uh, factors to uh, realize uh, uh, net zero emissions. Uh, but to, uh, there are many options, but I, at the same time, uh, there are lots of opportunities uh, of, of course, there are, are lots of opportunities, but at the same time, uh, lots of uncertainties uh, how to realize it. So, uh, uh, more uh, we need, uh, I think, uh, we, we have to uh, uh, present more clear image of net zero Asia and uh, show the, uh, uh, show the uh, challenges and the uh, possibilities uh, to, uh, toward the net zero. And I think all people should be involved to achieve uh, net zero. So uh, achieving the net zero depends on how quickly we can work on emission reduction now. And we need to start now uh, because the emissions, uh, greenhouse gases is already a <laughs> lot of stored in the uh, atmosphere and we need to uh, stabilize and we, we, we need to reduce them to avoid uh, the cl severe climate impact. So I really hope that today's discussion will contribute to the uh, pursuit of green recovery in Asia. Uh, today we focus on Asia and I have an announcement that tomorrow we focus in Europe and tomorrow uh, TT, uh, uh, Semantic Track 13 uh, uh, from 1630 to 1800 uh, Japan time, we will have uh, another session focus on green recovery in Europe. Uh, we truly look forward to your participation tomorrow as well. And our uh, final announcement is the uh, uh, this, uh, you already see this, and uh, I really appreciate the, you contribute the this survey. So there are all the viewers of this session Thanks for watching our, dis our discussion. Before leaving, please take two minutes to give us your feedback through our online survey. Your comments are the most valuable to improve the event. Thank you, and thank you for all the uh, participants to this uh, session. Thank you.